Hey friends, Peggy Hall back with you from the healthyamerican.org. Could your dog be a service dog or an emotional support animal? Let's talk about the difference. And there are some eye-opening facts that I uncovered that I would love to share with you because maybe you've got a question about these animals that you're seeing in grocery stores and on airplanes and in restaurants. You know, when I was growing up, I rarely ever I could say I never saw a dog in a restaurant. I did not see a dog in a grocery store or on an airplane. And as time has gone on, I've seen a lot of these animals and some of them are in little baby strollers. And many of them are just, you know, in the restaurants and grocery stores and on planes. And they're not wearing any kind of vest that says service animal. So it got me thinking about what is a service animal? What kind of training do you need to have for your service animal? So let's dig into this, shall we? I'm going to share my screen and I want to show you this. Uh, well, I've got a Substack for you, peggyhall.substack.com, and you can get all of the information here in a written format. I've started to see signs like this at grocery stores, no pets. And then it says, for example, on this one, service animals specifically trained to aid a disabled person are allowed to enter. And here's another one, no pets, um, service animals welcome. So what's the difference between a service animal and a pet? Let me know if you have a service animal. And I'm going to go, we're just going to cut right to the chase. And I want to actually share with you a document that I created. This is an informational document and it contains in my view, the most important facts about service animals. And I'm going to dive into all the details, but for those of you that only like to watch five minute long videos, this, this one's for you. You can leave after seeing this. Otherwise stay with me and we'll go into all of the details. But a service animal is defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm going to share that law with you in just a moment. And according to this law, your dog or miniature horse is allowed in this establishment called a public accommodation, regardless of any no pet policies. Now, this is what's eye-opening to me. The law allows the shopkeeper or the flight attendant or the restaurant owner to only ask two questions. The first question, is this, I'm, I'm calling it service dog, but it could be a miniature horse, according to the law. Is this service dog required because of a disability? That's the only question they can ask about a disability. They cannot ask what your disability is. And the second question is, what work or task has this dog been trained to perform? Now, here's the interesting thing. The person cannot require you to demonstrate, to have the dog demonstrate that activity, that task, or that work. And the law also prohibits anyone from asking, I, I suppose they can ask, but you don't have to answer, what your disability is. The dog, as I say, does not have to be required to demonstrate the task that they've been trained to do. And you do not have to provide proof of any certification. You don't have to go through any special training. You can train your animal yourself to perform this task. Finally, your animal is not required to wear any vest or have any identification, and you don't need to show any identification, and you don't need to show any proof that your animal has been trained as a service animal. This is eye-opening to me. Some would say that these are quite loose regulations, and others would say that seems reasonable. And the refusal of entry by the shopkeeper or the airline attendant or the restaurant owner would be a misdemeanor and it actually is a crime that they can be held accountable for, for this violation. So I created this document. You're welcome to copy and paste and print it out and have it as an informational card. So if you have your service animal and you're entering a grocery store or a restaurant or a movie theater or the courthouse, I have a list for you of all of these places that you are allowed to go with your service animal. Let me make it simple. Your service animal has the right to enter any place that you can enter without being restricted because of the breed, because of the size, because of the age. And even if the establishment has a no pet policy, that does not apply to your service animal. If you are going in for a pedicure and you have a service animal, your service animal can go. If you are going to the dentist, your service animal can go. Now stick with me. I am going to share a couple of cases 
where the proprietor would have the ability to exclude your animal. I'll explain that in just a moment. But I wanted you to have this information that you could print out, that you could keep with you. You can shrink it down. You can create a little card. No charge to you. This is my uh, just community service. I thank all of you that have supported me with a donation for the hours of time that I put in researching and creating these videos and writing the Substack for you. But I want everyone to have this information. So let's do this. I'll come off the screen share. This is available at uh, peggyhall.substack.com. This is published the day following the broadcast of my video. So what I want to share with you are the laws. So I just want to make sure you caught these important points. I'm going to repeat them. These facts were surprising to me when I did my research. Number one, you cannot be asked about your disability. I will list what some of the common disabilities are for you in just a moment. According to the ADA, it's not an exclusive list, but I will give you some idea of what those would be. Your animal does not have to demonstrate the trained task. Your animal does not have to wear any vest, tag, or any other identification item indicating that it is a service animal. Now, most people will have a, a you know, tag or a collar or something with the animal's name on it in your phone number in case your animal uh, does get loose, but you don't need any identification related to the service dog aspect of it. Okay. Let me just put one other um, factor here. The laws about rabies and licensing your animal they still apply even in the case of a service animal. For those of you that want to avoid having your animal be injected unnecessarily with all of these things, I have done several videos for you. Check on my playlist called Rabies and you can get a waiver. You can do a number of things that I've talked about in great deal, uh, in great detail. So don't let this uh, be a, an obstacle for you. There are many ways that you can keep your animal healthy and safe without going through that. All right. Your animal does not have to be certified by any national agency or outside expert. There's no national registry that you have to list your dog with. You can be the trainer of your animal for this specific task. There's no special licensing that your animal gets to be a service animal. I find this astounding. As I say, you can do the training yourself. It does not have to be done by another trainer. Your dog, your service animal can be any size, any age, any breed and cannot be excluded even in areas where there are breed discrimination uh, policies, which I am completely against. The breeds are not the issue. It's the uh, person who has trained or neglected or abused their animal that causes these behaviors in most cases. So housing, airlines, restaurants, hotels, transportation. I'm going to give you a list in just a moment. All of these places are required to allow your service dog or miniature horse entry unless, and I'll give that to you in just a moment, but in other words, wherever you can go, your service animal can go. The only exclusion would be if your animal is causing a disturbance and is not under your control. If your animal is disruptive, for example, growling, lunging, uh, excessive barking, posing a threat. Now, a bark may be part of the behavior that you train them to do to alert you to some sort of threat. If you have some type of loss of hearing and the dog can bark to alert you that there's a threat, that would be an authentic type of task that your service animal could do in order to keep you safe. Perhaps you are unable to bend down and pick something up because you have a problem with your knee or your hip or your back and your animal could retrieve something for you. That would be a legitimate task that your self-trained or outside trained animal, service animal could perform. So in this case, your animal, your service animal does need to be under your control. And the ADA, the American with Dis Americans with Disabilities, I'm going to share that with you in just a moment, they do state that your animal does need to be either on a leash or 
in a harness. It does not have to be in a harness, although you do see that with certain people with their service animals. Again, there needs not, there does not need to be any vest or any identifying tag that says service animal, no collar that says service animal, although some people do that. And let me know in a comment if you think that's a good idea so that it's more apparent that this animal is a service animal and, and you are not going to be questioned as to whether you have a pet. A service animal under the ADA laws is not considered a pet. It is a working animal providing a, an assistive service to you. Now, if your animal is not housebroken, if it is not under your control, then the proprietor could, under the law, ask you to remove your animal. You could stay, but your animal would need to be removed. So I think that's very important. Now, again, your animal should be on a leash or a harness, or if your animal has to perform a task where the leash or the harness would get in the way, your animal can be off leash if your animal is controlled by your voice or by hand gestures or some other signal or method whereby it is not going to be a threat or a danger or a nuisance in that area. So you could control your animal through voice or hand commands. I think it's very important to be educated on all of this. I've got it all on my Substack. You could print it out. You could have this. You could share it with people. If you're going places, maybe you're going to the bank or a grocery store and the manager is bothering you, you could educate them with this information. It's very simple and clear and easy to understand. The business or location where your service animal is taken cannot charge you extra for your service animal. The airlines cannot charge you a fee for bringing your a service animal on board. The rental car cannot charge you a fee for having your service animal in the car. In just a moment, I'm going to explain the difference between a service animal and an emotional support animal, and these are different. So I'm speaking here about a service animal that has been trained to perform a task that assists you with your disability, which could be invisible. Not all disabilities are visible. Now, this is interesting. You can have more than one service animal with you at the same time if they perform different tasks. So perhaps you have one animal that alerts you to any sounds and you have a different animal that picks something up if you dropped it. For example, I thought that was very interesting. Now, what if these places do not allow you to bring in your service animal? It is a misdemeanor. It is a violation of the law. So refusing entry to a service dog is a crime. It is a second degree misdemeanor in most states. Now, I want to mention that every state is required to follow the federal laws, the ADA, non-discrimination, for disabilities. Some states like California and Florida actually are more generous in their laws and they allow the emotional support animals to have many, not all, but many of the same protections as the service animals do, especially with housing. I'll speak about that in just a moment. First, let's talk a little bit more about the state and local laws related to service animals. Let me share my screen. This is from my Substack. All of this information I compiled from the ADA, which is the federal, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed as a federal law in 1990, adding on to the civil rights laws of 1964 that I've spoken about a lot in terms of religious protections. So let me share my screen. I will have links for you where you can go and read this as well. I took this right from their website. So state and local governments can require your service dog to be licensed you know, by the county, just like um, any other dog would be licensed and vaccinated if all dogs are required to be licensed and vaccinated. Remember, you have an opportunity to have a waiver for vaccination if your animal has a condition whereby the vaccine would cause harm to your animal. This means if your animal had uh, an adverse reaction. Maybe there were allergies, itchy ears, problems breathing, skin conditions, a lump that formed at the site, other lumps. All of these could be validated by an appropriate veterinarian who understands what goes on with the harms of these shots. And if your animal had one in the early years, as some veterinarians will attest, that should protect them against the disease for their lifetime. So there are ways to get waivers 
on my Substack under resources. I've got links for you to research and learn from. States can offer voluntary service dog registration programs, voluntary, which means it's not required. Now, there are plenty of sites. I've even spoken about them in years past about getting your animal with a certificate and a little vest and a collar, and you fill out some paperwork and you send in your money and they send you this information. Some people love that. I have nothing against it. I'm just saying that it's not required. So if you're spending thousands of dollars on all of this information, it's not necessarily not necessary unless you want to do it. State and local governments cannot require certification or registration of service dogs. I find this astonishing. And state and local governments cannot ban a service dog based on its breed. If you want to take a pit bull on an airplane as your service animal and your service animal has been trained to perform an assistive task that helps you if you're the handler, uh, you know, with your disability, you have a right to do so. And they cannot ask what your disability is, and they cannot have your dog perform the task or demonstrate it. You need to state what that is. You can say that my dog will, uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples in just a moment. This comes directly from the ADA. When it comes to service animals, the ADA and state service dog laws are very clear. If you have a disability, you have the right to take your service animal to a public place, I'll tell you what those are in just a moment, without being denied entry or being charged an extra fee. If a restaurant, a hotel, a cab, or other public accommodation, I'm going to define that for you, denies you entry because of your service animal, it's a crime. It's a second degree misdemeanor in most states, which means it's several hundred dollars probably as a fine. So let's look at samples, examples of the service animal tasks. This is not exhaustive. These are just a handful of examples. So a person who's in a wheelchair can have a dog that's trained to retrieve objects for them. But imagine if you are not in a wheelchair, but you are unable to bend over, you have a problem with your knee, your hip, your back. Some disabilities are invisible. They don't show on the outside. So if you have a dog that can retrieve your keys if you drop them, I don't see how that's any different from uh, any other type of assistive task that would be performed. A person with depression may have a dog that is trained to perform a task to remind them to take their medication. Wow, this is just amazing to me. A person with PTSD may have a dog that is trained to lick their hand to alert them to an oncoming panic attack. I would say probably most people in society could benefit from that kind of um, assistive help from an animal. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me know in a comment if you have ever had a panic attack, an anxiety attack, if you know someone who has, and if you believe that having a dog lick your hand would alert you to an oncoming attack and how that would help. And if you have or believe you could train your animal to do such a task, now you have a service animal. Caveat, I am in no way advocating that anyone sneak around the law. So I know my smart, savvy, sophisticated, and snarky, healthy Americans would never conclude that. But you know, every once in a while, somebody stumbles across this channel. They're sitting in the back row. They don't know all the work I've done for the last several years, helping people stand up for their rights. I am all about truth and freedom and honesty. So I'm not talking about skirting around the issues. These are legitimate concerns. And if you would like to have your dog be a service animal, these are the laws that allow for it. All right, let's go on, shall we? A person who has epilepsy may have a dog that is trained to detect the onset of a seizure and then help the person remain safe during that seizure. All right, let me keep on the screen here so you can see examples of disabilities. These are, okay, let me read from the ADA. A person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or major life activities, which include eating, sleeping, speaking, and breathing. This is why over the last several years, you were covered under the ADA because suffocating yourself impairs your breathing. So you legitimately had a medical reason to not put on the suffocation device. I think I told you about that, that I have a medical condition. 
and it's called breathing. I require the unobstructed flow of oxygen and other gases, and I need to release those on my exhale. That's how God designed me. All right. If you have a history or a record of such an impairment, or you are perceived by others as having an impairment, they give the example as a person who has scars from a severe burn, this, according to the ADA, would be a disability. Now, some of the actions, as I said, eating, sleeping, speaking, breathing, walking, standing, lifting, bending. If you have difficulty bending over to pick something up and you have a trained animal that can do that for you, now you have a service animal. Also following along with the other requirements that your animal is under your control, is not a threat to others, follows your commands and is housebroken and your animal cannot be restricted from any place that you would go. How about this one? Cognitive functions like thinking and concentrating. Those are disabilities. Now, I'm not sure how a dog would help you think and concentrate. Let me know if you think of something. If you can concentrate on an answer, it seems like that could be uh, some type of task that could be performed, maybe redirecting you, helping you concentrate, be in the moment and not... Um, distracted perhaps how about this sensory functions like seeing and hearing now i do have some vision impairment i've spoken about that on this channel i don't dwell on it i don't um, like to give that energy or attention but it is a fact and so if i had a dog i don't currently have a dog at the time of this recording i pray that god will bring another furry family member or two or more into my life uh, but perhaps I could have an animal be trained to assist me with seeing. There are some of our subscribers here that have told me they have some impairment with their hearing. So if a dog was to alert you as to a loud sound or somebody sneaking up behind you, they were to bark or alert you, that would also be a legitimate task that your service dog would perform. Any kind of tasks like working, reading, learning, communicating, all of these are considered disabilities if they are being impaired and the major operation of, of bodily functions. All right, so there's a wide range of disabilities. This is not a complete list. I will have it for you on my Substack. stack, uh, but these will just give you some ideas. And remember, you do not have to disclose your disability and you cannot, uh, your dog cannot be required to perform the task it's been trained to do. So you've probably seen dogs in grocery stores and restaurants and on airplanes, and they're not wearing any service animal vest or identification or tag or collar or leash. Now you know why. These service animals are not considered pets in these public accommodations, and they are allowed in any public accommodation. I'll define that for you in a moment. And these animals do not have to have any special identification or proof that they are a service animal. Who knew? All right, you can have a little um, teacup terrier. That's your service animal. You can have a miniature horse, for goodness sakes. That is your service animal. So uh, we'll talk about emotional support animals in just a moment. Let me talk about places of public accommodation. I spoke at great length about this. I think I uh, educated like the United States of America on what a place of public accommodation is because this is where people were being denied entry into a grocery store or a bank or a restaurant or on a plane or in an Uber because they wouldn't suffocate themselves. And that's illegal. It is illegal for you to be denied access or entry or services or privileges anywhere that is open to the public. Let me break that down for you. You have a right to breathe oxygen because you're required to breathe oxygen. You have a disability whereby suffocating yourself is harmful. You don't even need to tell them what your disability is. You are covered and you have a right to breathe oxygen. Now, I also have a religious reason for not covering my face because God told me not to. And I know that because he gave me the breath of life. And when you breathe in, it's also called inspiration. You are being filled with the spirit. And when you exhale, that's a, a type of expiration. You are uh, letting that used up breath go. 
that's how God created us. So I have a religious reason. I have a medical reason. And I also have ethical and moral reasons. And you don't really need a reason. But the fact is, you are covered for free and equal access to all of these places. And I educated people about this uh, for many years. So let me share my screen. And this comes again from the ADA. I have a link for you on my Substack. So a place of public accommodation cannot charge you extra to bring your service animal with you. Even if the establishment ordinarily charges a pet deposit, like at a hotel or uh, an Airbnb or a, a rental car, something like that, you don't have to pay it if it's a service animal. But if your animal does damage something, you would be liable for the damages your animal would cause, even if it is a service animal. Now, the rules for support animals are different. We'll cover that in just a moment. But public places, rental cars, hotels, so they can charge a pet deposit for the emotional service. I'm sorry, emotional support animals because they're not considered a service animal. So here are just some of the examples. Um, any, any business, including nonprofits that serve the public. Another definition is any establishment that is engaged in commerce. So there are some places that don't take money like public parks and beaches and courthouses. So I guess they take your money. Um, all of those places are also open to the public. But businesses like jewelry stores, ice cream shops, yoga studios, hair salons, they're engaged in commerce. And even if you need an appointment, you can walk in. And that's called a public accommodation. So Pilates studios, gyms, hair salons, a chiropractor, um, nail salon, restaurant. Uh, look at these here. Shops, motels, movie theaters, even private schools fall under this category. Doctor's offices are required to accommodate you. Private hospitals, daycare centers, gyms, organizations doing any kind of training, or if you have to go for an examination. I helped someone a couple of years ago, they were doing the SAT test and they wanted her to suffocate herself alone in a room while she was taking this test. And she didn't do it because we educated the uh, examiners on the law. Okay, privately owned transit, meaning if you have a like private driver taking you to the airport or something, they cannot require you to suffocate yourself and they cannot exclude your service animal. Now, uh, that would be buses, hotel shuttles, uh, airport shuttles. Now, also commercial facilities, um, office buildings, warehouses, factories, factories. You're not gonna be walking into some um, private warehouse or factory, but they do have to, the ADA does have to abide by design things like have uh, parking places and bathrooms that are designed for people that are in wheelchairs or otherwise are disabled. Now, here's something that's very important. There are uh, three exclusions from public accommodations. Number one is your private home. You can do what you want in your private home. You do not have to allow a service animal in. You do not have to allow someone wearing the suffocation device. It's your private home. You get to call the shots. So none of these federal laws apply to you in your private home. The second are religious organizations. I find that interesting. They don't have to follow these non-discrimination laws, which is why so many people had difficulty doing their religious exemption with their church. I had some teachers that taught at religious schools and they were being denied a religious uh, waiver for the cooties and also for the uh, suffocation device and the nasal assault because these religious schools and organizations are exempt from these non-discrimination laws. They can discriminate to their heart's content. So churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, they don't have to follow this, but you know, just good information to have. And the third, and this is where it gets into a little gray area, so I want to explain this clearly. There's something called private membership organizations. I'm talking about the Women's Republican Club of Fullerton, all right? It's a private group. Nobody can walk in off the street. They have closed meetings. It's not a public accommodation. Now, you might be able to ask them for an accommodation. I had a case with actually a fellow freedom fighter that wanted to attend a yacht club uh, luncheon. And they said, you have to wear the suffocation device. Now, let me just tell you, this is a very well-known individual that was one of the first voices on the scene to speak out against this. I'm gonna keep it anonymous, but she contacted me and said, Peggy, can you believe this? I belonged to this yacht club for 20 or 40 years, however long it was. And now suddenly they're not gonna let me in because I wanna breathe oxygen. Well, guess what? 
It's a private club. Strangely, they have the right for any kind of requirement. They can have a dress code. They also can exclude service animals, which means you would not be able to attend if you needed that animal to assist you. However, I would make a good faith effort to seek a reasonable accommodation for any of these things that a private membership club might exclude you from. So there are golf courses, for example, where you have to have a membership. I don't play golf. I don't have a yacht. I don't belong to any of those kinds of clubs. But you're going to say, well, Peggy, Costco, Sam's Club, those don't apply. Even though they're a membership club, anyone can walk in off the street and get a membership if they pay for it. Further, anyone can walk in and use the pharmacy without being a member. And anyone can walk in and use the restroom without being a member. And you can walk in as a non-member with, you can even walk in, you just can't check out. And you can walk in with a friend who is purchasing things. So Sam's Club, Costco, those do not apply. Therefore, your service animal is allowed in those places. Glad I could clear that up. Let's talk about emotional support animals. There is a different definition. They do not follow, they do not fall under the definition of uh, a service animal. And what's the only difference? I think you can tell me in a comment. Let me know how we define service animal. A service animal is trained to perform a task that assists you with your disability, which can be visible or invisible, the disability that you do not need to disclose to anyone and your dog or miniature horse does not need to perform that task. What is an emotional support animal? It's a dog or other animal that has not been trained in any specific task, but it provides overall emotional support or comfort, okay? That animal under the law does not qualify as a service animal. These animals are called emotional support animals and they are not covered under the ADA. Now, a few states like California and Florida, I want your homework is to check your state. You're going to, if this is of interest to you, you're going to research, you can email me, support at thehealthyamerican.org. Let me know what you find out about your state. And these states, California, Florida, there may be others, actually have disability discrimination laws that include emotional support animals as a reasonable accommodation, especially in housing. What does that mean? If you are renting an apartment, leasing a property, even from a private party, even if you're not just renting in you know, a big apartment building, but if you're renting or leasing a house from an individual, these laws require the landlord to accommodate you, certainly with your uh, service animal. And in some states, having your emotional support animal be able to be present is also accommodated in the non-discrimination laws regarded to housing. I've not researched all 50 states. I would like your help in doing that. I do know that Florida and California have more um, generous coverage for the emotional support animals when it comes to housing. I can't say the same that they're allowed into the restaurants and you know hotels and everything without being charged as a pet. So you would need to figure that out on a case by case basis. Now, it seems to me, and I think you would agree with me, if you've had, if you've been uh, blessed by having a furry family member who is a family member, that any person who has been blessed with the love, the care, the comfort, and the emotional support of your furry family members, um, all animals would certainly fall under that category of being an emotional support animal, because that's exactly what they do. They provide unconditional love. There's no judgment. They're there for you. They rely on you. And they, in turn, provide this incredible indescribable emotional support. So what should you do if you don't have a service animal, but you have an emotional support animal? Well, I spent the most of this video describing service animals. So the first thing you could ask yourself is, could my dog qualify as a service animal? Do I have a disability that interferes with my everyday life functions? that I could train this animal to do or that this animal, my dog could be trained to, to do. 
I would ask yourself that because maybe you were mistaken thinking that your animal had to go through all sorts of training and all sorts of certifications and licensing and registrations and all of that. And it's not the case. So that would be the first thing to have a legitimate service animal. Now, if that isn't appropriate in your situation, then if you have an emotional support animal, remember just having a little vest on or something is really not enough in public accommodations. They're not required to accommodate you, but check your state laws regarding the ADA. Again, California and Florida have reasonable accommodations for housing and entry into public accommodations. I think that's why I do see a lot of animals coming in. And the same thing, just like service animals, your emotional support animal does not need any documentation at all in terms of they're an emotional support animal. They may require, you know, registering with your county or these uh, other vaccine certifications, which we've talked about already. But in terms of indicating that it's an emotional support animal, you don't, there's nothing you have to do. Um, now, some places, like I showed you that uh, earlier photo, there are some signs that I've noticed coming up at grocery stores and things saying, we do not allow emotional support animals. So they're really going proactively to say only service animals. But keep this in mind, places like hotels. Again, when I was growing up, I never ever saw a dog in a hotel or anything. Now I, I see them all the time. And so car rentals, hotels, airlines, most of these are going to accommodate your emotional support animal, but, and here's the biggest difference, they will likely charge an additional fee. So you know, I haven't had this experience personally, but it may be uh, the hotel will charge an extra $50 a night, or maybe the car rental will have a deposit that's returned or something like that. Let me know if you've taken your animal on a plane and if you had to pay an additional fee and if there were any other regulations. So the law does allow for your emotional service animal to have this additional charge. So that's something you wouldn't really want to fight because there's no law that protects you on it. Um, okay. I think that that wraps it up, friends. I want to hear from you. Do you have a service animal? Do you have an emotional support animal? Let me know the name, the breed, the size, what they do. And um, I am curious if you knew all these things. It's absolutely news to me, which is why I wanted to bring it to you. And I really would love for you to consider how this information could impact your life if you haven't gotten an animal because you thought, oh, it's so much trouble. I can't take uh, my animal anywhere. Well, perhaps there is an option for you. Or if you know someone who has been struggling in this area, please share this important information with others who can benefit. Let's continue to educate others to help keep our precious furry family members safe and protected, to not have these uh, medical interventions imposed upon them, to not have them uh, prohibited from entry to places where they could go if they fall under these uh, guidelines and regulations. So thank you everybody for being on board. I hope this was a helpful video for you. I really appreciate having you as subscribers. I know that YouTube likes to unsubscribe. So do me a favor, resubscribe, hit the bell notification. If you would share the video, if you would like the video, this helps us outwit that uh, YouTube algorithm so that my information can get out to more people. Thanks everybody, have a great weekend. A quick reminder, all of our paid donors and paid subscribers are invited to our monthly webinar and we are coming right up. That is this Saturday, it's the last Saturday of every month at 4 p.m. Pacific and I always have a wonderful guest speaker. Uh, well, sometimes I don't, but often we have guest speakers. And today we have, uh, or coming up, we have Pastor Kemble from KPAC Bible Church in Michigan. He's a healthy American. He's a personal friend. And even if you are not a person of faith, I believe that you will uh, receive some spiritual encouragement for these turbulent times that we find ourselves in. All right. Thanks, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you in an upcoming broadcast.